I used to work a retail job. I did several jobs at that company, but near the end I was doing order pulling for online orders and deliveries, and it was a lot of work. Hard work. A lot of the products at this store that had to be pulled were things like concrete, shingles, lumber, stone, soil that had to be trucked across the store at a mall walk pace all day. And I was good at it. I was fast and accurate and I worked hard, but I was only making something like eleven fifty an hour and that was in my fifth year at the company. I thought I should be making more than that, and I had a pretty good relationship with the manager at this store, I thought, so I went to his office and I told him that I thought I deserved a raise. And he agreed with me, or at least he told me he did, but he told me that he needed to get it approved by regional or whatever, so he, that he would get back to me. And I left that office satisfied with the interaction, but the problem was that he never did get back to me. I guess he didn't want to have the confrontation of telling me no, so he just ignored it. I never did get that raise, and nothing much changed at the store until I left the company, but what was I going to do though, I guess? Capitalists will tell you that labor is a commodity, just like anything else, and in a free market it'll reach an equilibrium because the employer and the employee both need something from each other. But that assumes that the power structures are equal, and they're not. I was in a state where you can't get unemployment benefits if you quit your job, and Finding another job would have taken a little while if I had quit, so I had a lot to lose by quitting. But the company was a massive corporation, and if I quit, they would have just been able to replace me in a week, and I had plenty of other employees to pick up the slack while they were waiting. We both needed something from each other, sure, but I needed what they were giving me a lot more than they needed what I was giving them. So why would they give me a raise? They knew that I probably wouldn't quit if they didn't, and even if I did, I was pretty replaceable. That's the fundamental problem with treating labor like a commodity that you can just leave to the free market and everything will be totally fine. And that's a problem that gives corporations a license to treat their employees just about however they want, usually poorly. That's where labor unions come in, or trade unions if you're not an American. Labor unions are a way of democratizing the workforce. They're groups that employees form together so that they have more power to push for increased pay, better benefits, better hours and working conditions from the company. If Ian asks for a raise, they probably won't give him one because if he won't work, they'll just fire him and he's pretty easily replaceable. But if a thousand workers all ask for a raise and go on strike, they're a lot less easily replaceable. I don't think that that power is so hard to understand. You hear a lot of people say that if you have a weekend or a vacation, thank a union. If you have an eight hour work day, or if you have workplace safety laws or maternity leave, you can thank unions for that. But it's not as common that they explain how unions got us all of those things. So what's the history behind that? How did unions become so successful and what happened to unions? I'm Ian Stevens, and you're watching The Lucretia Report. I've heard it said that capitalism is actually just a short blip of a few hundred years in the whole course of human history. And that's true, but I think that it would be disingenuous to pretend that the system that came before capitalism was any better for common people. In most of the world, we've never had a system that was good for commoners or peasants or workers or whatever you call the non-affluent masses of that particular society. Government has just about always favored the wealthy. Before capitalism, most of the Western world operated under a feudal system. Most economies were still agriculturally based, and most people were peasants who farmed to feed themselves and their families. Part of the proceeds of their land would go to a landlord, who were actually lords back then, and in exchange the landlord would give them protection from brigands, raiders, or war. In theory this seems like a fair trade, but of course within this system exists a massive power imbalance. The landlord was the one with all the soldiers and the knights and the money, and if he didn't hold up his end of the bargain, say someone came to steal your cattle and he didn't do anything about it, then you didn't really have much recourse. In fact, you would probably still be responsible to give him just as much of the output of your farm, leaving you with less. 
But if you didn't hold up your end of the bargain and pay your taxes, the landlord had a pretty compelling recourse for you. The unaccountability of the landlords and their monopoly on violence of course led to abuse. Serfs who were little more than their property, bound to the land and compelled to hand over part of their produce, and if the lord decided that he wanted more from you, you didn't really have much you could do, and if the lord started abusing their serfs, then there wasn't really much you could do unless you were lucky enough to have a higher lord step in. The earliest examples of the working class banding together to push back against unfair conditions were the peasant rebellions of the Middle Ages. Prompted by some condition that was especially hard on peasants, harder than they were used to, these were always suppressed. The most famous one is usually called simply the Peasants' Revolt, or more specifically Watt Tyler's Rebellion in 1381. The English Parliament had raised taxes on peasants to help fund a war with France, and fallout was still lingering from the Black Death, which killed, depending on your estimate, up to 40% of all people in England. Something to understand is that unlike our income-based taxes today, most taxes back then were fixed, which meant that the poorer you were, the harder the tax burden was on you, and if something happened and your crops failed or you for some reason weren't producing as much, you still had to pay just as many taxes and you were just that much harder hit. The Peasants' Revolt was successful for a time, it called for the lowering of taxes and the abolition of serfdom, and with the army mostly away to fight the French and the Scots, the rebels successfully seized London, burning a palace, slaughtering royal officials, ransacking the tower, and forcing King Richard to accept their demands. But soon he raised an army, and like always, he reneged on his promises, crushed the rebellion, and executed its leaders. Meanwhile, trade guilds were also active across Europe. I didn't include these as an example of working people banding together because these were mostly made up of more affluent middle class craftsmen, but nonetheless they're an important ancestor of today's labor unions. These guilds operated within a single city and a single industry, sanctioned by the local government. If you wanted to be, for instance, a carpenter, you would have to join your local guild for that, and they would dictate what training you have to do to become a carpenter, and how their members were supposed to behave. But while guilds could be controlling, they also benefited their members by setting prices that prevented them from undercutting each other and lowering their wages. There is debate about whether medieval guilds should be rightfully considered an ancestor of unions because guild members were not employees but self-employed businessmen, and they often had lower level people like journeymen and apprentices who worked for them and were not allowed to bargain collectively. There's a good argument to be made that these are more akin to cartels than modern day unions, but whether or not these are an actual ancestor of unions, I think it's obvious that the idea of collective bargaining within an industry, especially to control pay, which they pioneered, is an important precursor to unions. The first signs that the feudal system was starting to change was when landlords started fencing in the commons, dividing up areas where the community would have previously grazed their livestock at will and placing them under the ownership of single individuals. Our modern concept of unions began with the Industrial Revolution. With the invention of more advanced agricultural techniques and the mechanization of agriculture, fewer and fewer people became needed to work on farms. Meanwhile, new manufacturing techniques drove the development of new labor-intensive industries and cities. This led to a massive realignment of the economy, with mass migration from the countryside into cities in search of work, and more and more people who previously worked for themselves coming to work for an employer and earn a wage for the first time. In America, 1870 was a big milestone in this change. That was the first year that the census recorded that a majority of American men worked for someone else instead of themselves. At this time, there was no such thing as labor laws. There was no OSHA and there was no minimum wage. Most people in America worked six days a week for 10 hours a day, but shifts as long as 14 hours were not uncommon. Pay could be as low as 10 cents an hour, the equivalent of two to three dollars an hour today. And needing to support their impoverished families, children were often hired to work in factories, mines, and other industrial places, either because they worked for lower wages or because they were convenient for dangerous jobs in small areas. Workplaces were dangerous, and workplace deaths and accidents were common. 
There were no precautions for safety put in place, and the heavy industries of the day often meant exhausted workers at the end of a 12 or 14 hour shift working with massive and dangerous machines. When they went home, their economic situations necessitated them living in cramped, dark tenements in shoddily constructed buildings where diseases spread like wildfire. This was the day-to-day -day reality of a vast swath of Americans, and individually, there was nothing much that workers could do. They needed the wages, and they were easily replaceable if they complained or quit. This drove workers to band together and form unions in order to increase their power. Appropriately, the first union started in the same place that the Industrial Revolution itself started, England. And at first, a crackdown against them was brutal. They were seen as little more than rabble-rousers and troublemakers holding back industry and progress, as if progress matters if people's lives aren't getting better. Amidst the French Revolutionary Wars, the British government feared that unions would contribute to a French-style revolution in the country and passed the Combinations Act, which outlawed unions. At this time, unions had to disguise themselves as fraternal organizations or philanthropic organizations, but when they were found out or they tried to take part in union activities, the crackdown against them was usually violent and draconian. In 1831, protests in Merthyr Wales rose up against the lowering of wages of coal miners in the region, and these protests escalated into riots. These were put down by the army, with 24 dead and 26 injured. Two people were sentenced to death by hanging, and others were sentenced to imprisonment and transportation to Australia. The Merthyr Rising is also believed to be the first time that the red flag of revolution was ever used. In 1831, the so-called Tollpuddle Martyrs were six farm workers who formed the Friendly Society of Agricultural Laborers. When they became involved in a labor dispute where they refused to work for less than 10 shillings a week, they were arrested, convicted of swearing secret oaths, and sentenced to transportation to Australia. And by the way, at the time, Australia was not well developed yet, so transportation to Australia often meant a death sentence either in the horrid conditions in the ships on the way to Australia, or in the wilderness once you got to Australia. Over time though, unions continued to spread, and as they gained popular support, government actions against them laxed some, although company actions to bust unions remained severe, often using violence. In America, we would not be able to talk about the pioneering of unions without talking about the Knights of Labor, which, starting in the late 1860s, helped workers across a wide range of industries organize and aided in strikes and negotiations with employers. The main goal of the Knights of Labor was an eight-hour workday and the abolition of child and convict labor. More broadly though, the Knights of Labor wanted to restructure the way that the economy and the relationship between labor and employers worked, and did a lot to popularize the idea of labor unions in America. By 1886, 20% of workers in America were affiliated with the Knights of Labor. But this largely failed to accomplish the goals they'd set out, and their loose structure was viewed as too weak to be of any value against the violence and manipulation that owners were willing to employ. At Haymarket Square in Chicago, a confrontation between strikers and police turned violent, and someone threw a bomb which killed several Chicago police officers. This resulted in a brutal crackdown against unions by the police, and saw more than a hundred arrested. Members of the Knights of Labor viewed this as a failure of the organization to protect the movement, and this led to an exodus of members from the Knights of Labor to the American Federation of Labor. By 1890, the Knights had only one-eighth of the members that they had had before the Haymarket Affair. Founded by cigar maker Samuel Gompers, the American Federation of Labor would, in contrast to the more generalized Knights of Labor, be centered around many smaller craft unions that focused on a particular industry. What we know today, where we have teachers unions, teamsters unions, auto workers unions, and other specific unions like that. This allowed the individual craft unions to be more focused and direct, but their broad affiliation with the AFL still allowed them to mutually support each other. This model proved more successful than that of the Knights of Labor, but the AFL was criticized by some on the left for being too willing to work within a corrupt system. One of the major competitors to the AFL was the American Railway Union, led by Eugene Debs, who would later go on to be an iconic leader of American socialists. 
This competition between the ARU and the AFL came to a head with the 1894 Pullman strike, which saw a quarter of a million railroad workers around the country rise up against a wage cut by the Pullman Railroad Company. Eventually, this strike would be put down by the army, and Debs would be sentenced to a six-month term in prison, where he read the works of Karl Marx and was radicalized into the version of Eugene Debs, who is more famous to us today. The suppression of the Pullman strike showed that the federal government, though it claimed to be hands-off on the economy, was more than willing to come down on labor unions in favor of business. It also led to the dissolution of the ARU, cementing the AFL's place as America's dominant union. Eventually, the AFL would merge with the Congress of Industrial Organizations to form the AFL-CIO, which remains the largest organization of unions in America today. Although the suppression of unions would remain fierce and violent, unions would persist, and over time, many of their goals would be met. In 1893, the Safety Appliance Act applied federal safety standards to railroads, and the same thing happened for coal mines in 1910. Workers' compensation laws began to emerge in the early 1900s, and in 1912, Massachusetts created the first minimum wage in America. The biggest victory for unions, though, came in 1938 with the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act by President Franklin Roosevelt. This would create the 40-hour work week and the concept of overtime pay, it would create the first federal minimum wage, and it would abolish child labor. This gave unions most of what they were asking for at that time. The decades after the Fair Labor Standards Act were the golden age of organized labor in America, with most industries having powerful unions and at their peak, one-third of all American workers being members of a union. This would coincide with the growth of the American middle class and one of the greatest periods of economic development in American history. This progress was short-lived, however. After peaking in the 1950s, union membership would begin to gradually decline until the modern day when only 1 in 10 American workers is in a union, and that number is even smaller when you isolate it to public sector workers. Unions have long been associated with left-wing politics, and during the Cold War, anti-communist attitudes and the Red Scare raised suspicions in the government of unions as hotbeds of spies, subversives, communist sympathizers, and revolutionaries. The Taft-Hartley Act, passed over a presidential veto, put these suspicions into action, banning many union activities like general strikes and mass picketing. These attitudes were capitalized on further by the rise of conservatism and neoliberalism in American politics, which advocate for deregulation and laissez-faire economic principles. During this era, 27 states passed right-to-work laws, which prohibit unions from making contracts with employers, gutting their influence and making unions virtually non-existent in those states. Up to the modern day, the government has had anti-union attitudes, hamstringing them in law and emboldening companies to take part in more widespread union busting and anti-union activity. Today only 1 in 7 workplaces that vote to unionize actually do so, and those odds are only 1 in 10 in workplaces that have been charged with taking part in unfair labor practices to discourage unions. Unions have been seeming to go through a long death in America, and our current economic position reflects this. Income inequality is at levels higher than it's been since the Gilded Age. Wage theft is rampant, workplaces like Amazon and Walmart are becoming more abusive than ever, companies like Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, and Instacart are using the designation of independent contractor to avoid benefits and keep pay low and wages have been stagnant for decades. Workers don't have the ability to put pressure on their employers anymore, and there's no one pushing the government to support the rights of workers, and it shows. Conservatives and neoliberals told us that deregulation would lead to unparalleled economic prosperity. But the truth is that it's only led to the reversal of decades of economic and social progress. No one is under the impression that modern-day America is living up to the promises that they teach us in school. Everyone knows that something is wrong. Everyone knows that this is broken. But it's not good enough to know that it's broken. You have to recognize the changes that need to happen and follow through with them. And step one of that process is to start with unions. If you want to hear more from me, consider subscribing to my weekly newsletter. Every Friday, we send you the most important news events of the week from our proudly and unapologetically progressive point of view. You can subscribe for free at lucretiareport.com slash email hyphen list.
Hey guys, I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, please be sure to give the video a like. You can watch another video here, and why not subscribe here? Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, links in the description. And special thanks to Rebecca S, Mainly, and Julie M, she's new, for their support on Patreon. Join them at patreon.com slash Report.